All right, good morning and welcome everyone to our final set live session of the 2021 Virtual Tillamook County Children's Clean Water Festival. My name is Alex Lee Tigner. I am the Community Education and Engagement Coordinator with Tillamook Estuaries Partnership. And I'm really happy to be here today with my co-host, Bruce Carden. Bruce, you wanna say hello? Hi, everybody. Glad you're with us. I hope you've enjoyed this event that we've been doing, putting this all together for you. We've had a good time doing it. Different for sure, but hopefully you're learning a lot. This is Bots Marsh that's behind me that's found up in Nehalem. And it's right on the Nehalem River. Beautiful spot. You ought to check it out sometime. Great. Thank you, Bruce. And we're really excited today to welcome Julia Treisenberg from the Columbia River Maritime Museum, who is going to be um, post giving us our presentation today. Julia, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here for today's Clean Water Festival. I'm really excited to be talking with you today. And we're excited to have you here. So just real quick before we begin, um, a reminder that only our presenters will have videos and microphone during this presentation. So um, you will not have your video, but you are able to send us messages and questions in the chat. Bruce and I will be monitoring the chat while Julie is giving her presentation. And then at the very end, we will have a Q&A session where Bruce and I will um, take your questions from the chat and ask them to Julia and she will answer them. Just a reminder that today's session is being recorded and it's going to be available on our Clean Water Festival webpage at www.tbnep.org um, later today or tomorrow. And along with uh, this recording and the other recordings from our live sessions, we also have our online exhibit hall on the website that has additional activities, videos, and great things from our partners um, that's still being updated too. We're gonna have a couple more activities posted um, today or tomorrow and um, potentially even into the next week. So, and that will all um, remain on our website. So you can continue to access those materials and utilize them um, whenever you want. And a final reminder that um, your artwork for the um, Fish Art Contest is due to your teachers today. Bruce and I will be coming around and picking it up tomorrow. Um, and next week we'll be judging for the Tillamook Estuaries Partnership Contest. Um, and then we'll submit your artwork um, for you to the Wildlife Forever State Fish Art Contest. Um, so if you can get that to your teachers today, we'll pick it up tomorrow. And um, if you can't get it in, or if you're not at one of our Tillamook County K through five schools, you can also bring it by the Tillamook Estuaries Partnership office this Friday, anytime between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. I'll be here to take that, to accept that artwork. Um, and I think that's everything we have for announcements. So I will pass it over to Julia. I'll stop sharing my screen and she will give us our presentation. Welcome, Julia. All right, perfect. Thank you, Alex. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you once again for being here with us today for our final presentation with the Clean Water Festival 2021. Once again, my name is Julia and I work at the Columbia River Maritime Museum in Astoria, right where the Columbia River meets up with the Pacific Ocean. And today, I am so excited to be here with you to talk all about marine debris along the Oregon coast. So if you've ever been walking along our coast and you've seen trash in the sand or in our waters nearby, then you've come across this stuff that we call marine debris. Marine debris is anything in our oceans or in the Great Lakes that is solid, that is man-made and that isn't supposed to be there, right? The really simple idea here is that it's basically trash in our oceans. And the thing about this marine debris is that it comes from a lot of different places and it's mostly made up of everyday items, things that you and I see all the time without even thinking about where it's going to end up. So that could be things like styrofoam, it could be things like plastic spoons or toothpaste tubes. Really little things can end up in our environments, right? Like this Q-tip with our sweet seahorse. 
Sometimes entire bicycles or cars, shipwrecks would count as marine debris. And of course, all of these everyday items like plastic bags or cups or bottles, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Sometimes, of course, this marine debris ends up in our environment by accident. And a really good example of this is called derelict fishing gear. Derelict kind of being like a fancy name for abandoned or missing. A lot of times this fishing gear will fall off of fishing vessels in the middle of the ocean and end up in our coral reefs, in our environments where all of these animals are interacting with it. Of course, this fishing gear is meant to catch things, right? So sometimes it will accidentally catch little crabs or seabirds or sea turtles, and it will entangle them. It will make it really difficult for these animals to move around and survive in their environments. And so today, my friends, really quickly, we're going to do a little simulation, an experiment to see what that would be like to be trapped in some of this derelict fishing gear. And in order to simulate this feeling, you are going to need one rubber band, okay? Or a hair tie sometimes if you have one with you. You can do this with me now or you can do it later. It's a really simple activity to see what this would feel like. So what we're gonna do, my friends, is we're gonna take our rubber bands and dangle it on our thumbs. And once we have that, we're gonna take the other end here and wrap it around the back of our hand onto our pinky. All right, so you can see in these photos, you can see my video. Here's the front of my hand, here's the back of my hand with that rubber band on there. Now, this is my wing if I was a seabird or a flipper if I was a sea turtle. And what I'm gonna try to do, my friends, and I want you to try this with me, is I'm gonna try to free myself only using this hand, right, or this flipper. I'm even gonna take my other hand and I'm gonna put it on my elbow so that I can't use that without meaning to. I can't cheat on this experiment, right? So try to free yourself. You can't use your other hand, you can't use your teeth. Just have to kind of make your way around. And I can guarantee you, my friends, <laughs> I have tried this activity a few times before and I have never been able to free myself. So let me know what this experience was like for you. Was it frustrating? Was it harder than you thought, easier than you thought? I've only been doing this for a few seconds and I'm already pretty annoyed by it. So you can imagine for these sea animals in our oceans, right, to be trapped by something like this for even a day, but maybe weeks or months at a time, it could really constrict your movement, right? It could really hurt your ability to interact with everything else in your environment. Now, my friends, you can keep doing this if you really want to free yourself as we're talking more about marine debris, or if you're frustrated like I am now, you can take off your rubber band and promise me, please, that you will not fling these at your classmates. If you're in the classroom today, be a good classmate and hang on to that rubber band until the end of our presentation. Now, there are a few most common types of marine debris that we can find in our oceans. And some of those most common types include cigarette butts sitting out in the sand or floating in the water, super gross, plastic food wrappers. So if you like to go do McDonald's or like me, if you really like Taco Bell, um, all of that stuff can end up back in our environments as marine debris. Plastic water bottles are a really common form of trash in our oceans. And of course, the bottle caps that are on top of those plastic bottles. And the final most common source of marine debris that you guys have probably actually all heard about, of course, is plastic straws. Now, what do these five things have in common? Well, they're all made in some way with plastics. Right? And plastics aren't totally a bad thing, right? There are a lot of good uses for plastic. It's really cheap to make. You can use it for a lot of different things and people all over the world take advantage of those aspects of plastics. But the problem that we're facing more and more, my friends, is that we're using a lot of single use plastics, right? These things that we'll use once and then throw away and never think about again. We don't even know where they're ending up. 
as we're throwing away all this plastic and it's ending up in our environment, it's breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. Pieces that are so small that we've actually given them a whole new name and that is microplastics, right? Plastics that are so small, sometimes we can't even see them with our eyes. We have to use a microscope to know that they're there. And you can imagine, right, the problem with not even knowing that plastic pollution is, our, is in our environment is that we might accidentally be playing in this plastic. We might accidentally be eating or drinking this plastic. And some scientists think, my friends, that we're actually breathing plastic in some areas without even knowing. So it's becoming a really big problem to have all of this single-use plastic that's breaking down into tinier and tinier pieces. Or these microfibers, like you see here, that could come from towels or clothing, and we don't even realize it. Now, we've been talking a little bit about where this marine debris comes from, right? These single-use plastics or that derelict, remember abandoned or missing fishing gear. Sometimes huge shipping containers will actually fall off of these ships in the middle of the ocean and they become part of the marine debris environment. And one really big one, of course, if you look over in this right corner here, you see there's an overflowing trash can. There's some stuff on the beach, some flip flops and beach balls. All of that stuff, that litter that we see on the ground can end up as marine debris. And the important thing to know about this, my friends, is that even if that trash seems like it's really far away, right? Maybe it's in a forest or it's in your downtown, in your backyard, you don't think it's really close to our oceans, it can still make its way into our water system because our environments are all interconnected, right? Our ponds or our rivers can flow into these larger lakes and eventually our oceans. And so even if you don't think that it's very close to those environments, it could still end up there by accident. So it's really important that we continue to clean up those areas nearby us because it might have kind of a domino effect and hurt all these other aspects of our communities without us realizing. Of course, there's a bunch of different ways that this can affect us. So for example, my friends, did you know that coral is not actually a plant? A lot of us think that coral reefs are plants, but they're actually animals. Coral is made up of a bunch of tiny animals called polyps. And these polyps form coral reefs as like the foundation for all of these animals' homes in the ocean. They create a place for them to live, a place for them to eat and to hunt, but coral reefs are being smothered by plastic pollution. And as these coral reefs are dying, animals that rely on those reefs are struggling too, right? They don't have a home anymore. They don't have a place to eat anymore. And so while that might seem like a small problem at first, it could also start to affect all of these other animals, including us, right? Say we rely on those animals for our food and in our lives. And so habitat damage is a really big effect from marine debris. Of course, we talked about that entanglement, that ghost fishing, this idea that derelict fishing gear can trap animals weeks or months or years later and really affect the way that they move and hunt in the ocean. Let me know, my friends, if any of you have managed to free yourselves or if you're still struggling with that rubber band there, I'd like to hear how that's going for you all. And this next picture I'm going to show you after we look at our sweet seal who's been trapped in some fishing gear is a very sad image, my friend, of what happens when animals ingest or eat plastic. This photo is a picture of an albatross chick whose stomach is full of plastic. And once again, you can see one of those most common forms, those plastic bottle caps that its mother accidentally fed her baby. Because what will happen is as this plastic is breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces, it's releasing chemicals into the water. And it's also attracting algae that sticks to that plastic. So the longer that plastic is in the ocean, 
the smellier it smells and the tastier it seems to animals like the albatross. You can imagine, right, that a stomach full of plastic after a while doesn't make you feel so good. So this is a really big problem for all of these animals who can't tell the difference between their real food and plastic that smells and looks like food. Last but not least, of course, would you want to go on vacation and a polluted beach or swim in polluted water? No, this affects tourists and it affects locals, right? People like you and I who live along the Oregon coast, who live near these rivers and lakes and streams, it's really important to keep those areas clean. Thankfully, of course, now that we're experts on marine debris and what all of these different causes of marine debris can be, it's important to know that there's a lot that we can do to solve this problem, right? First and foremost, right, we can clean up this litter that could end up in our oceans. Like I said before, whether it's in your backyard or in your downtown, in your hometowns, or if it's right on the coast, you can encourage your friends and your families to go out and clean up that litter. And you can tell them that these environments are all connected. And so even if it seems really far away, it's still important to pick up that litter and protect the animals and you who live in those areas. I know my coworker, Ms. Kelly, and I love to go out to our beaches. It's a very safe, socially distant activity that we can do and see what are the most common types of marine debris in our area. That's one really good question to keep in your minds. Almost even better than cleaning up trash in your areas is helping to make sure that plastic doesn't end up as marine debris to begin with. Right, so you've probably all heard of the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. We say those to ourselves all the time to help kind of um, eliminate how much plastic is going into the environment. Today, I want to introduce to you the fourth R, which is refuse. That's saying no to those single use plastics that we talked about, right? Trying to use reusable bags, having a reusable water bottle instead of all of those plastic water bottles. There's a lot of different ways that we can make an impact, right? And even if it seems really small, that's one less straw going into the environment or one less plastic bag. And if you all encourage your friends and families to do the same, same, imagine what can happen when these whole communities come together to help clean up that marine debris. Thank you all so much for being here with us today for our final presentation with the Clean Water Festival. Once again, my name is Julia from the Columbia River Maritime Museum. I hope that I will see each and every single one of you one day in Astoria at our museum when it's safe to do so. And with that, I'll turn it back on over to Alex. I would love to hear any questions or comments or stories that you might have about what we talked about today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia, for that wonderful presentation. And I'm going to pass it over to Bruce and we're going to um, do the Q&A session. So if you we've gotten a couple questions so far in the chat there, I've seen. Um, so if you have any questions for Julia, um, go ahead and send them in the chat and Bruce and I will ask her them. Well, that was very good. Thank you, Julia. One of the questions I thought was pretty good is, does garbage from the dump still make it to the ocean and cause damage to the environment? So if That's you're being responsible really taking it to the dump, then what happens then? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And you know, that is a really common problem that more and more places are having is that we're actually running out of room to put our garbage, right? So if you've ever driven past a dump before and you've seen those piles and piles of trash sitting there, it takes a very long time for that plastic to break down, right? So that it can fully absorb or go away in our environments. And so yeah, sometimes that plastic will actually fly through the air, right? If it's like a light um, chip bag or something like that, it can end up in our water still. Sometimes it's just sitting there for so long that it will still break down into those smaller and smaller plastics and can affect us that way. So really good question. Cool. Um, is there any way to recycle the plastic that's already in the ocean so it doesn't get back there again? Yeah, also a very good question. And I've actually been experimenting with this a little bit myself. What I have found is that sometimes you can reuse the things that you find on the beach to make reusable bags 
or to make different art pieces. So what I will do is say, I'll take a whole bunch of bottle caps that I find and I can make them into all these different shapes and patterns and use it as art in my home. Or I'll take plastic bags and I can actually form them into different shapes and iron them together. I know it sounds really crazy, but this plastic will melt to form a whole new object that I can reuse. And I can actually look into some of those activities and send them on to Bruce and Alex later too, because it's pretty fun. Cool. Um, does metal debris affect the ocean water? Metal debris, yeah, metal debris does affect the ocean. Um, if you think about different shipwrecks, right, or different tires like bikes, cars, things like that, um, that can all affect the ocean. And it probably breaks down in a different way than plastic would, right, because it's made of different things. But I actually don't know the specifics of how long that metal ends up in the water. That would be something good to look up. Uh, one of the students wanted you to know that they've been to the museum up there. They think it's pretty cool. So that's kind of nice. You're impacting that way, too. Um, let me see. What if you can't reuse it and you have to throw it away? I'd imagine they're talking plastic, but. Yeah, I mean, that's really the thing, right, is you can't reuse everything. Some of it we try to eliminate by refusing those single use plastics, by trying to find other ways around it so that we don't have to use um, that plastic pollution. But you know what, sometimes you just do your best. And if you can't completely get rid of it in your life, that's okay too. It's good to be aware of the problem and to try to do your best to help get rid of some of the stuff you're using. Uh, I noticed one of the students wrote in and said they've helped on the beach cleanup before. And I wrote back to them and said, thank you for being part of the solution. Cause that really is picking it up and taking care of it responsibly part of the solution. And that's something we can all do. Uh, does paper in the ocean affect the environment as much as plastic? A really good question. And my answer to that would be no. It does affect the environment in some ways, right? Because once again, it's solid, it's man-made, it's not supposed to be there. But paper tends to break down faster than plastic pollution does. So there's less of a chance of really harmful chemicals or those larger pieces of plastic affecting animals in the environment, as opposed to paper, which breaks down really quickly. Uh, one of the questions is, oh, I lost it, where to go? Is, um, oh, it was a really good one too. <laughs> it was, uh, what, what can we do to help clean up the microplastics? Yeah, so there are a few different things that people are working on to pick up um, microplastics themselves, right, once they're already broken down in those teeny tiny pieces. But what I would suggest to you is that you just work on picking up as many visible pieces of plastic as you can, because you know what, the longer those bigger pieces of plastic stay in the environment, the easier they break down into smaller pieces. So even if you can't see microplastics or microfibers, it's still really good to pick up those larger pieces before they break down. Good question. I, I know that I have friends that they do the big beach cleanup, but I also don't have friends that will take a bag with them when they go to the beach just on a walk and pick up stuff. They don't have to wait for that special day that Saul puts on. It's just being responsible when you're there and, and picking up things so you don't uh, let that stick around. I have that impact that goes on there. Um, where is it? Does any object affect the environment more than plastic? Any object affecting the environment more than plastic? You know, I don't know if I totally know the answer to that, but what I will say is that there's a lot of different types of plastic, right? So that's one thing that we're facing as well is some of this plastic has more harmful chemicals than others. Some of it breaks down faster than other types of plastic. And so that would be something good to look into is what are the different materials that are maybe the worst for the environment, or some maybe better than others. Oh, here, here's a great one. Have you considered selling recycled art made by students at the museum? I have not considered that, but I'm considering it now, and I really like that idea. Thank you for sharing that with me. I think that's a doable thing. Definitely. 
Very good. Um, it says, what happens when you breathe in microplastics? So that is a really good question. And this is a really new idea that scientists have thought about because we haven't really dealt with microplastics until very recently, right? Over the last few years. And so to be honest with you, there's not a ton of science over what happens to you once you've breathed in that plastic pollution. But I bet you can imagine that it's not very good for you, right? So whatever those specific issues are, we don't totally know what the answer is yet, but as time goes on, we'll probably see people have more health problems because of that. Oh, where'd it go? Um, a lot of comments from people helping with the beach cleanup, which is really cool. That um, makes my heart so happy. Being part of the solution is how you kind of make things work out there for sure. Um, how long does it take plastic to, to break down? So uh, there are a bunch of different types of plastic pollution, right? Like I mentioned earlier, and they all break down in different ways. So uh, I don't have, let's see, specific dates or years for you. But some things, for example, like a diaper, I think takes like 80 years or something to break down. I mean, it's a crazy long amount of time for this plastic to fully go away in our environments. And so that's to say, right, that's something that you throw away today might still be in our oceans when you're a very, very old person and it hasn't broken down all that much. So depending on the plastic pollution, it can take a different amount of time for it to break down. Um, one of the kids is asking, says, can we burn the plastic, like melt it and make it something else out of it? So that's kind of a uh, two part, two part question. Definitely, definitely. I would recommend that you find ways to reuse that plastic if you can. I would not recommend burning the plastic because again, right, as this plastic is breaking down in different ways, like if you burn it or melt it, put it in your fireplace, it's releasing all of these chemicals that it's made up of, right? And so thinking about breathing in those plastic fumes that you're burning, that's probably not super healthy for you. But if you can find other ways to reuse it, like ironing those plastic bags, like I mentioned, that's a pretty safe way to reuse plastic. Um, that would be a better bet than just putting it in a bonfire. How about, do engines from boats affect the animals in the ocean? Engines from boats can affect animals in the ocean or propellers, say, from a lot of boats can affect animals in the ocean. Um, in terms of marine debris, it's probably similar to having like a car or a bicycle or something like that in the water. That's a good question. Oh boy, these things keep coming through here and I'm trying to sort them out. Which ones are the questions and which ones are just comments? Um, this plastic... Here, it is 1030 now. Okay. Um, so I think I have one last question that I saw that I want to ask Julia. Okay. Um, so it was, why can't people make vents or something that can pull water and take out plastics from the ocean? I am so glad you asked that. There are actually scientists and engineers who are working on that exact solution that you mentioned. So maybe if you study this really hard, you could become one of those engineers that does that too. And something that they're working on along our coasts, especially in California, is these kind of um, aquatic garbage bins almost. If you can imagine like a trash can that's floating in the water, it's attached to vacuums that will try to suck up any of the plastic pollution that's in it. And it gets to the point where they collect so much garbage that they actually have to clean out that trash can about once every week or so. Um, so really good question. There are scientists and engineers who are working on that problem, but it's something for the future to start thinking about too. It could be a future project here on our coast. Well, thank you so much, Julia. That was wonderful. And I, thank you everyone so much for the great questions. I know we didn't get to ever get to get to everyone, but it um, is an opportunity for you to do a little more research if you're really interested in learning about what we can do to help prevent marine debris and some of these other programs that are starting like this, um, this 
removing debris from the ocean, or I know they're also working at ways to um, address derelict fishing gear too, to prevent losing fishing gear or finding new ways to um, clean it up. So we have a lot of opportunities for you to keep learning out there if you wanna keep going. And I did wanna share too, um, real quick on my screen, that if you want to get involved in a cleanup, um, the Oregon Spring cleanup is coming up exactly a month from today on April 17th with Sol. And all throughout the state of Oregon, and especially here on the coast, there's going to be a whole bunch of cleanup opportunities um, that you can get involved in. And if you go to solveoregon.org, you can sign up for one of those events. Um, Tillamook Estuary's Partnership is going to be hosting one at Barview Jetty Park um, that you can join us there. And I know there's going to be other ones throughout Tillamook County in North County and the Halem um, and further down south too. So you have an opportunity coming up in a month to get out and help address our marine debris and be part of a whole statewide cleanup event um, to be part of the solution. And then I just want to say thank you everyone so much for joining us for these live presentations um, during Clean Water Festival and for just joining us this way virtually. We really did miss you um, in person this year um, and we cannot wait to have you and have Julia and our other presenters join us in person next year. Um, and you can still access all of these materials online if you happen to miss anything and we'll be continuing to add more resources and hopefully Julia, hopefully Julia will send us some of those resources she talked about and we can add those activities or those ways that you can um, recycle your plastics here coming up too. So thank you again. I wanna say thank you so much to Bruce for being my co-host through all of this. It's been wonderful to be working with him and a real pleasure and it's I couldn't have done it without him. And thank you to all of you for continuing to attend. Um, and just keep an eye out for more materials coming up. And we hope to see you at an in-person event soon. Bruce, Thank do you want to say anything? <laughs> this has been one of those challenges that we didn't know how we were going to do it, but we approached it kind of like what Julia was talking about. There's things that haven't been invented yet because the problem hasn't been there. And these are some of the solutions that we've come up for the problem that with COVID. So you guys... No, your future is in front of you and you have all these opportunities to take advantage, learn and be part of the solution. Yes, thank you, Bruce. And Julia, I forgot to let you know that as soon as I hit end, it's gonna kick us off too. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you.